Hello, and welcome to the When Words Collide 2022 Festival Keynotes. This is one of my favorite parts of When Words Collide. And if we were in person in Calgary, where this conference is normally held, I would have been lucky enough to be sitting beside the amazing panel of guests of honor that you're going to get to hear from tonight. And just the conversation that we've had, uh, you know, on the side of the stage here, just prior to, if that's any indication of the quality of the keynotes and the Q&A that we're going to have afterwards, you are in for a special treat. Now, without further ado, I want to bring the chairperson of the conference, Randy McCharles, up. We're going to hear a word from Randy, and then we're going to get right in to these awesome keynotes. So I hope you are comfortable. Wherever you are watching this from, you have potentially a, a drink in hand, you've got your feet up, relaxed, and... Uh, and you're going to be inspired and entertained. So, Randy, welcome to the stage. Welcome to When Words Collide, Chapter 12. That's right. Our little festival has been running annually since 2011. Neither snow nor rain nor gloom of pandemic stays the festival from its appointed rounds. But we couldn't do this without you. Thank you all for your support throughout the years. As many of you are aware, this is our third year online instead of in person. The good news is that technology has allowed us to continue the festival while health safety has prevented us from traveling and meeting in person. The better news is that vaccines are combating the pandemic and we are now entering what many call the new normal. To that end, the festival is optimistic that next year we will be back as an in-person event. At this time, When Words Collide is announcing that we have a contract with our old stomping grounds, the Delta Calgary South Hotel, for the weekend of August 4th through 6th, 2023. Those who bought festival passes for 2020 or 2021 are already registered for next year's in-person festival. In a few weeks after we organizers have recovered from this year's festival, we will make a more formal announcement along with additional information. We hope to see many of you next year at When Words Collide Chapter 13 in person. Now, if you can't wait a year, I'd like to suggest a WWC inspired festival that is happening late next month in person in beautiful Pentec in British Columbia, the Wine Country Writers Festival. You can check it out at wcwfestival.com. That's wcwfestival.com. Before we get on with the keynotes, I just want to take a moment to thank our many sponsors, which include Calgary Arts Development, Alberta Foundation of the Arts, Calgary Win World Fantasy Society, Dodge the Bullet Comics, Taiki Books, The Century Box, Books and Games, and the Calgary Public Library. I also want to recognize our affiliates who have put together most of this year's program, ARWA, the Alberta Romance Writers Association, Brain Leg Books, Creative Edge Publicity, Fit to Write, IFWA, the Imaginative Fiction Writers Association, Go Indie Now, Prairie Owl Publishing, On Spec Magazine, Sisters in Crime Canada West, Crime Writers of Canada, Solar Punk Magazine, Taiki Books, and the Writers Guild of Alberta. Last but not least, I want to thank this year's presenters all of whom have volunteered their time and expertise to make our festival unique among festivals and conferences. I also want to thank the inestimable Mark Leslie of Direct to Digital and Wide for the Win, who has been a past festival guest, longtime supporter of our event, and host for tonight's keynotes. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Randy. Now, for our main attraction, what are we're going to do, just so everyone can uh, know well, what order we're going to do this in. I know Randy liked to uh, randomize it and just <laughs> surprise attack people on, on the stage, but we're going to do this in alphabetical order of our keynote guests. So I'm about to bring up the introduction for Terry Brooks, and I will disappear, and when that finishes, Terry will be magically on the stage, and I'll be hiding in the green room. So... Terry Brooks coming up. Terry Brooks was born in Illinois in 1944. 
He spent a great deal of his childhood and early adulthood dreaming up stories in and around Sinisippi Park, the very same setting for Running with the Demon. He received his undergraduate degree from Hamilton College, where he majored in English literature, and went on to earn his graduate degree from the School of Law at Washington and Lee University. A writer since high school and heavily influenced by William Faulkner, it took him seven years to finish writing The Sword of Shannara, which published in 1977. It became the first work of fiction to ever appear on the New York Times trade paperback bestseller list, where it remained for over five months. He published The Elf Stones of Shannara in 1982 and The Wish Song of Shannara in 1985, both bestsellers. Since that time, he has written numerous novels in the Shannara, Landover, and Word Void series, including being hand-selected by George Lucas to write the novelization of Star Wars The Phantom Menace, which hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. The Shannara Chronicles, a first-season, ten-episode TV show, premiered January 5, 2016, on MTV. It adapts the Elf Stones of Shannara and features the creative talents of John Favreau, Al Go, Miles Miller, Jonathan Liebsman, and Terry Brooks as an executive producer. Terry Brooks lives with his wife Judine in the Pacific Northwest and on the road meeting his fans. Wait a minute. Ed? Wait, did you say this? I'm not, I'm doing this for free. Did I agree to do that? All right. So welcome back all of you who were here yesterday. Welcome to anybody who's new. These are a series of presentations by the four writers who are involved in the conference talking about whatever they want to talk about, which can be really good or really bad. And you'll have to make that judgment for yourself. What I'm doing today, you'll be happy to know, is I'm going to talk about something that I never talk about. In fact, I have made it a point never to talk about it until now because I despise this particular subject. The subject is framed in a particular question that all writers hear over and over again. And I've steered clear of it every time because it's such a difficult subject to address. And it is this, where do you get your ideas. Because really, we could write books about this. But wait a minute, I think I did. And it's the kind of thing that you can go on on and on and on about, and nobody cares, except for the things that apply directly to them. Um, so whatever I'm going to say to you today, you're free to use if you're a writer, you're free to riff on if you're not. Uh, maybe some of it will be helpful to you, maybe it won't. We'll wish for the best, but at least you'll get to hear how one writer approaches the subject of putting ideas together. Let me start with this. I'm, I'm going to give you three obvious examples of uh, areas that I had to consider early on and have had to consider ever since on a regular basis in order to make my storylines work. Um, and for each one, there's a number of things to consider. The first one is something I call shuck your baggage. Uh, when I'm saying shuck your baggage, I'm saying to you, cut loose all the stuff that doesn't apply to what you're doing in your life that's important. So what does that mean? Well, in my case, it meant that at one point in my life I was writing and I was discovering I was not doing well at anything else. So I quit writing and I, then I still wasn't doing very well at anything else. And what I really discovered was, is that if you're going to be successful in this business, you have to find a way to balance the way that these all the all the things that are in your life work. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that everything you know now, or everything I knew then, which has been, you know, more than 60 years ago, is going to change. It's not going to stay the same. It's like you aging. Everything you do when you're 20 is different by the time you're, oh, let's say 60 or 70. The reason it changes is because, number one, you change. Number two, the world changes. Think about this. When I started out, computers weren't there as personal computers. We used handheld, hand, hand operated, not even electric typewriters to do our work or pens and pencils. And that's how writers grew up working in that fashion. I started fairly early uh, professionally in my 30s with a 
an old uh, Apple computer, an Apple II or something like that. And that's how I learned to be a writer is with that computer. How much has that changed? Well, you know, we could go on a long way about how the mechanics and the operations of computers have changed to the extent that now it's much easier and smoother to work. Something that my old editor, Lester Del Rey, once told me, this has ruined writers forever because now it's so easy to put something down. They think everything they put down is wonderful. And there is a temptation to believe that when it becomes so easy to do so. But I think, uh, you know, video games, social media, uh, television, all of those things are extraneous to the work that you're doing. If you're a writer, you should be reading books and you should be reading books all the time. You know, you should make that a major part of the work that you do because you're working in that field. But I'll talk about that a little more until uh, a little more later. Um, so in any case, uh, I believe that the first thing you should do when you start to put a book together is to work it out in your head. Put it in your head. Uh, go over it as many times as you need to. Work it out step by step, scene by scene, story by story sub story by story, all the way through and evolve it as you go. Rework it as you go, rethink it as you go, but don't write it down. Put it in your head because if you can't remember it, it's probably not that good anyway and you weren't meant to remember it. Keep it in your head for a while. When you get to the point where you absolutely can't help yourself any longer and you do feel you need to write it down, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But the point is you want to stretch it out as long as you can in a place where you can call upon it. And if your memory works the way that most people's memories do, stories tend to stay there quite a bit longer than otherwise. After you've got enough of your story down to a point where you think you've got the sense of the world, you've got a sense of where things should be, what you want to do, what your big idea is, that sort of thing, then you have to talk about characters. And that's when you have to have a casting call. What do you do at a casting call? Well, it's just like it is in the movies or in plays or in any form of entertainment. You decide who the characters ought to be. And how do you do that? Well, you always have characters floating around in your head if you're anything like me. You're always thinking about how somebody was or how they should be or what it'd be interesting to be if they were there. So you pull them out and you put them on stage and you look for a part for them in the story. It's pretty easy, really. You always have an antagonist. You have a protagonist. You have the companions of each. You might have some kind of a strange creature. You might have all kinds of things, a love interest. It doesn't matter. All of these things have to be there, or many of them have to be there to make your story come together. So you start trying them out in different formats. And you can do this in any way you want to. But the point is, you have to see if you can find something that seems to you to fit. If you do that, you have character one or two or whatever. If they don't work, back to central casting. They can come out later in another story or they won't and we'll have to see. What's the most important thing about the characters that you put in a story? I bet you don't know. They have to serve a purpose in advancing the plot. That is the most important thing. The plot is at the service of the characters. The characters are at the service of the writer. You have to create characters that do something to advance the story and don't just hang around looking as if they were trying to find something to do. This is not easy, but it's doable. And you can do it because I bet you you've done any writing at all. You've probably done it. Okay. Um, what's the other thing I want to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, the third thing I want to talk to you about that I think is really important has to do with the fact that you have to be consistent and you have to be creative, but you also have to be dogmatic in your approach. When it comes to putting together, this is your format. You write, then you rewrite, and then you write some more, and then you rewrite some more, and then you do it again any number of times. Everybody works in a different way. Everybody finds a more comfortable way to advance a story. But the thing is, you have to find a format that works for you, something that you're comfortable with, but also achieves what you're trying to get done. If you find yourself being blocked off or you're unable to advance often enough, then you're probably not doing something in the right way. And you need to think about how to do it. And for everyone in this business, everyone, the one thing I know for sure is that nobody works in the same way. Everybody works in a different way. Everybody thinks about approaching a story and puts together a story and creates that story with all kinds of different things that happen. 
you have to find the way that works for you. Uh, one of my favorite writers, as a matter of fact, told me that the way she does it is she writes plot first, then she goes back and she does it rough form, just rough form and writes the plot. Then she goes in and she adds the characters. And then after she's done with that, she goes back and works out the time and the place and the you know, how to show and so forth and all of that and so on and so forth. She has like, I don't know, eight or 10 steps that she takes in putting this together. That would drive me crazy. I could not possibly do that. My approach, for example, is to go through and write the story piecemeal as I go concentrically in order. And then at the end of every stopping point, which is usually a chapter, go back and rewrite it. Do it again until you get it to a point where you like it. This won't be the end of it, but it's a place where you can move forward. I can move forward to where I think I've got something to work from in building the next chapter. So there's a cohesion to everything as I go. But this is, these are just, you know, this is one way to do it. And the trick is to find the way that works for you and to find a way that feels, you know, a part and parcel of who you are so that it works the right way. Okay. Um, a couple other things I want to talk about before my time is up. Uh, and at this point, I don't even know how much time is left. So I'm going to just go on here. So, uh, I mentioned earlier about the importance of engaging yourself in the area in which you're working. So if I were, you know, if I were making movies or I was on theater, that's what I would probably be most involved in. But I'm not, I'm writing books. So how do I feel about an approach to writing books? Well, the first thing is, is that it means you have to read a lot. And the way you learn about the craft, because it's changing all the time. You know, I used to think that the approach of young adult uh, fiction was something to be avoided at all costs. Now, young adult fiction is one of the big monsters that moves the whole industry. And the way that it's developed, it has been astonishing. And we have some terrific, terrific writers working in that field that don't get nearly the kind of notes they ought to have. But the point is, is that if you don't read in the field, you don't know about this. Also, whatever you're reading, if it's only in the field that you're working in, change it right now. Don't do that. Read outside your field. Why should you do that? Well, because if you're only reading science fiction or you're reading fantasy or reading horror, that's mostly what you're going to learn. And you're going to learn it from other writers. But the point is, is that sometimes you'll discover in reading something in, say, literary fiction that appeals to you or historical fiction or even nonfiction, you're going to find ideas come to you about things to do that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Because I write in worlds where we're not involved directly, it's always what I know about this world transposed into a world that I've created from whatever. If I have my world to work from, I kind of know what it is I want to say that I want to get across. It, I just have to put it in a different format. And I think that's a much more successful way for me to work than to try to just create something from nothing and not pay attention to what's going on in the larger world. And I've said this many times, you know, I wrote a whole series of four books in the Shannara series, all about the, eco the ecology, uh, about the way ecology is being destroyed, about the way the world is being wasteful, so on and so forth. I wrote any number of books that had to do with how do you redeem yourself when you have created the mortal sin or any series of mortal sins? Is there a point where you can't come back or can you always come back? And if you can, how do you do it? To me, these are questions that are, uh, that, that are applicable to all of our lives and that impact all of our lives as well because of the way the world around us works. These are the kind of things that engage us immediately because we have an immediate identification with it. And I think that's something that you would lose if you don't read outside your field, if you don't read contemporary fiction, if you don't look at areas that you don't normally engage in. So that's the kind of things I think you should, you should consider doing. And I think you have to be experimental at what you're doing too. You have to experiment with where you're going with the kinds of stories you're writing, because again, we're back to that whole thing about everything in your life is going to change. And what interested me, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 
I'm not so interested in that anymore. I'm interested in other things. And I want to write stories that speak to what interests me at the time. I want to write about issues that are generic to my life, but are impactful at the time that I'm addressing them. Um, and I believe that particularly with something like fantasy and science fiction and generic fiction, that you're always looking for ways to extrapolate from the real and put it into the creative and seeing what you can make of it and how you can make it come alive the way you would like it to. Final thing that I'll throw out before I say that's enough of that. Um, I started out as a pretty shy little kid. Um, I'm the kid that got beat up all the time on the way to school. And uh, in the days we walked to school, I don't know if that happens anymore, but I did. I had to walk a mile to school every day. So uh, there were lots of chances for someone to beat me up. And I was about, you know, four foot high. So it was pretty easy business for most people. Um, and I discovered uh, that uh, part of what you need to do with your life is to envision yourself as something better than what you are and then try to make something come of that. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. I'm not going to get into that because that will just take us forever. But I am going to tell you that uh, you need to... Uh, develop your ability to communicate with other people. Um, you need to be able to address issues and problems that you're going to encounter. And this is not only true of just your general life, but it's very much true of your life as a writer. When I started out, uh, the theory in the field was that writers should stay home. My editor told me this uh, flat out. He says, you're not going on tour. You won't, you don't need to do that. You're not, you're not anybody particular at this point. And I said, well, I just sold Sword of Shannara. What do you want? And he said, I want four more books and then we'll talk. And he wasn't kidding. He said, you will stay home. You will stay at the desk. You will do your writing. And after you've gotten to that point, then we can talk about you going on the road. You know, he would roll over in his grave now since, you know, we've gotten into a, an area where writers tour all the time. But the point was, is he felt that you had to learn to express yourself before an audience he felt that you needed to learn who you were and what you were as a writer and have something to talk about besides, you know, the wonderfulness of yourself or of your work or something like that. You needed to be able to address the situation, whatever it was. And you needed to be able to do, to, to do this in a spontaneous way. I got a break because I was a lawyer for a long time, and that makes you prepared for just about anything in this world. Um, I can't say that uh, it prepared me for being a successful writer uh, because writing legal briefs has nothing to do with writing fantasy, even though in my world, it's a short putt. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. It works better when I unmute my microphone. I was saying thank you so much for that, Terry. That was <laughs> it's all right. Awesome. All righty. So thank you, Terry. I'm going to send Terry back to the green room where he can take a bit of a break before I bring him back on stage. And uh, and our next guest who is going to be speaking is uh, Susanna Kearsley. And uh, Susanna will be on stage momentarily. <laughs> New York Times, USA Today, and Globe and Mail best-selling author Susanna Kearsley is a former museum curator who loves restoring the lost voices of real people to the page, writing twin-stranded stories that typically interweave modern adventure with romance, historical intrigue, and sometimes an edge of the unexplained. First published in 1994, she's been a full-time writer since 1996 and is currently at work on her 15th novel. Her books, which have sold over a million copies in North America alone, are available in translation in more than 25 countries, have won the Catherine Cookson Fiction Prize, RT Reviewers' Choice Awards, and National Readers' Choice Awards, and been finalists for the UK's Romantic Novel of the Year and the Crime Writers of Canada's Arthur Ellis Award for Best Novel. A settler on Anishinaabe land near Toronto, she has also lived in Texas, South Korea, and, all too briefly, in Wales. Hi, and thank you for making me go after Terry Brooks. That's really not nice. Terry, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I love the short putt line. Um, 
as Mark said, um, I am a settler on Anishinaabe lands uh, here in Ontario. I'd like to start by uh, extending my um, my respect to their elders past and present and that same respect to anybody who might be joining us who is Indigenous and uh, encouraging everybody to learn what treaty um, binds them to the, the land and the peoples that, uh, that they are living on and, and, and to honour that treaty, please. Um, Okay, so it was difficult for me to try to figure out what to do. My my um, keynote on, I'm not great with keynotes, but I really wanted to do a good one for you, so I did my best. Um, I went looking for a, a quote that would sort of embody what I was trying to to talk about. So I think I found one. Um, we're often told that, that writing is a lonely life, and I was looking for a, a quote that would sort of talk about that. And I found one by the American author, Jessamine West who said, writing is a solitary occupation. Family, friends, and society are the natural enemies of the writer. He must be alone, I guess he or she, must be alone, uninterrupted, and slightly savage if he is to sustain and complete an undertaking. As with many maxims, it does hold a core of truth. When we put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, we are on our own. And I've often said it's not unlike the miller's daughter in the Rumpelstiltskin fairy tale who's left alone with bales of straw and asked to spin them into gold, except we are left alone with reams of paper that we're being asked to turn into a finished novel or a finished story. So yes, that part, getting the words down on paper, getting the story down, only we can do that. And to do that, most of us will have to make some hard choices. We have to turn down some invitations. We have to shut ourselves away a little. That's kind of a feature of our lives, but solitary? No, I'm, what I do, I never truly do alone. Far from being my natural enemies, family and friends and societies are the things helping me to write. Take my family, for starters. Early in my writing career, I was fortunate to have my sister who bought me how to write books and wrote in the flyleaf, because I'll always believe in you, who pestered and dared me to finish my first book and cheered me along at every step. I had my parents who let me move home with them as an adult and gave me a room in their house, that Virginia Woolf room of one's own that is so essential for anyone trying to write. When I married and had my own children, my own little family, they helped me too, both with their hugs on the bad days, the days when a publisher dropped me, and there were quite a few of those, or when the words weren't coming well, but also with their purposeful absence by giving me privacy, giving me space, taking over the housework to give me the time that I needed to write. Any child or spouse of a writer deserves an award. They deserve a medal. It's not easy. We sometimes forget them. We don't always feed them. We wander around half in this world and half in the world of our characters. But I could never do what I do without my family. My friends, too, are always essential. My writer friends help reassure me it's okay to hear voices in my head. It's perfectly natural and everybody does it. It's perfectly natural. When I'm not sure what to do with a story, my writer friends are always there with advice. They're my sounding board. They're sometimes the first people who hear my stories. And in the middle of each work in progress that I start, when I'm sure that I've lost all my talent, when I'm sure that the publishers are going to make me return my advance, when I'm sure that I can no longer write and the readers are going to hate this book and I'm sure I should just throw this new book in the garbage can every single time, I start a book. They convince me it's okay that I do this every time. They remind me that I do this every time. It's okay. I will get through it, they say. And maybe they tell me, maybe it's time for my non-writer friends to just come grab me and drag me out of my writing room just for a little while to remind me that there's a whole world out there beyond the page. It's that world, that society, that we writers need if we're going to have anything to write about. And it's that society that also supports us. I'll give you a little example. Years ago, when I landed in Scotland, I was doing the research for my book, The Shadowy Horses. I landed in Scotland on a bank holiday weekend. 
with no place to stay because that was how much forethought I gave to it. Um, a bed and breakfast owner named Margaret McGovern took me in at the last minute. And as I was coming in the front door of her bed and breakfast with my suitcase, she was going out on her way to teach her country dancing class. And she asked me why I was in Eyemouth, Scotland, of all places. It's a very small town on the coast just over the border and really not the place that a lot of people would be coming to on a bank holiday weekend. It's just a little fishing town, was a little fishing town in those days. And I was just sort of getting to the point in my career. This was 1994. Um, I had won the Catherine Cookson Prize. My book was about to be published for the first time. Um, I was just getting to the point where I felt comfortable telling people I was a writer. I felt kind of like a writer. So I told her, I'm a writer. I'm here researching a novel. And that felt kind of, you know, grand. And she said, oh, I in that sort of, you know, Scottish way that they have that where it's just kind of, yeah, yeah. And out she went to teach her country dancing class. She came back two hours later with a list this long, very, very long <clears throat> of all the people that I was meant to meet over the next week and a half um, who were going to help me with my novel. One of the first people on the list was the local minister. I had to meet him twice. I had to go first to the early service to meet him and make myself known to him. And then I had to go meet him at the second service. And he was, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I did the three hour um, masterclass this morning, lost my voice. The second service, he was going to take me out to a ruined priory that they decided needed to be in my book. So I better go out there with him. They found a house that, I needed to use for my book. They had all decided, everybody at the class decided that I needed to use this house in my book because a murder had happened there once in the 1700s, which would make it the perfect, perfect setting for my novel. Um, turned out it actually was the perfect setting for my novel and I did use it, but at the time I didn't know this. The, the only problem was the woman who owned the house was a very reclusive uh, woman, a little shy. She had just been burgled a couple of weeks before and now here was this young Canadian, I was only in my 20s, woman being sort of thrust upon her to, to go and see this house. So I thought, well, what if I go to the police station first and I'll show them my passport and then this woman will know that I'm not a complete crackpot and, and I'm a legitimate person. So I went to the police station and the police officer, a young police officer behind the, the, the desk in this two-person police station said, oh, you're the writer. He said, are there any murders in your book? And I said, well, not yet. And he said, well, if there are any murders, be sure you give us a phone call. Here's my card. There's always one of us in here. They brought the other person out, showed me. So everywhere I went in the town, this is what happened. Everybody came out of doors to help me, every single person. If I went around the harbor, people came off their fishing boats, invited me onto their fishing boats, almost took me out you know, to sea in their fishing boats. It was just the entire community came out and helped me. That woman... Um, Margaret McGovern, who was my my bed and breakfast owner, is still a dear friend of mine 30 years on, nearly 30 years on. Society, you know, helped me write that book. I would not have been able to write that book if that town had not taken me under its wing. And that has happened more times than I can count in the writing of my books, more times than I can count. Society is not my enemy. Madeline Lengel wrote, the writing of a book may be a solitary business. It is done alone. The writer sits down with paper and pen or typewriter and withdrawn from the world tries to set down the story that is crying to be written. We write alone, but we do not write in isolation. No matter how fantastic a storyline may be, it still comes out of our response to what is happening to us and to the world in which we live. I totally agree. Friends, family, and society will never be our enemies. They're what makes our writing possible. They hold us up and carry us and keep us sane. We may sit alone with our pen, our paper, our typewriter, our computer, but we are never, ever on our own. And I hope you remember that as you go through your writing career. Thanks very much. 
Thank you so much, Susanna. That was fantastic. Great, uh, great talk. I'm going to let you uh, rest the voice for a little while again because you've been at it all day. Oh, get into the green room and get 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 yourself something to coat that throat with. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, we are going to uh, turn it over to our third uh, guest of honor, and our third guest of honor is um, Hank Philippi Ryan. And uh, as usual, you will see uh, bio for Hank, and Hank will be on the stage. Hank Philippi Ryan is the USA Today best-selling author of fourteen psychological thrillers winning the genre's most prestigious awards, five Agathas, four Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She's also an investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV, winning 37 Emmys. Book reviewers call her a master of suspense and superb and gifted storyteller. The First to Lie garnered a Publishers Weekly starred review and was nominated for the Anthony Award for Best Novel and Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her current thriller, Her Perfect Lie, received starred reviews from Kirkus and Publishers Weekly, which called it a superlative thriller. It is now an Agatha nominee for Best Novel of the Year. Watch for The House Guest, coming in 2023. Good evening, good evening, and so wonderful to see you all. Susanna, I am so with you. Susanna knows I'm a big fan of hers. And I also taught a masterclass this morning for three hours. So if I sound a little like Brenda Vaccaro, that is why. And I hope you all enjoyed that. Wow, it is so nice to see you all. And I have to say, this is not exactly how I thought it would be. I thought, I thought I'd finally get to come to Calgary in person, but alas, that is still in the future. I have to admit, and I know this is probably similar for all of you, that not one of the past days since March 12, 2020 has been what I expected. Isn't that absolutely true? Back then, I was in the middle of writing this book, Her Perfect Life, when the pandemic hit. I was 15,000 words into this book, and I was feeling fabulous. And I flew to West Palm Beach, Florida for a big book event. And I was writing like crazy on the plane, feeling powerful and really loving my book. But I will admit, even then, I was already a little bit terrified. Should I be going, I thought? Remember how uncertain we all felt at that time. So I did the event with the fear in my heart, balanced with the joy of seeing 250 people in a room all holding my book. Um, the murder list was out at the time. Um, and I, I hightailed it after the event. I hightailed it back to the airport, thinking all I want to do is go home. Um, I knew I was on the right track of going home. I'm going to turn off the air conditioner here. I knew I was on the right track of going home when I got into the airport and I was in the jet blue waiting area. And some people were already wearing masks at that point. And there was a woman in the jet blue waiting area who had a mask on. And at one point she pulled down her mask and then she sneezed and then she put her mask back on. And I thought, okay, I'm done. I just want to go home. So you should know that usually an airplane is my favorite place to write. And, you know, I guess I feel contained in it and I have a deadline. I'm going to be home in two hours. I'm going to write my thousand words a day on that plane. But at that time, I remember I opened my laptop and I pulled up my manuscript and I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't write. I just stared at the screen. And as the terror of the unknown hit me, I wondered if I would ever be the same again. So now, 500 days later, a thousand days later, however many days later it is, I, I, we are not the same. We are not the same, but we are writers and we are professionals. And as the result of the pandemic, we have all learned, we have all learned a lot. And that is my title for tonight's keynote. I'll tell you what the real title is. I'm really rubbish at titles, but the title that I chose was 
the top 10 things I learned about writing during the pandemic that then I realized I already knew. But that is not that is not a very good title. But the top 10 things I learned during the pandemic as a writer that I realized I already knew. And let me share those 10 things with you right now. The first thing we learned as people and as writers is that we learned how to deal with fear. We learned, number one, we learned how to deal with fear. How many of us, as we sat down to write at the beginning of the pandemic, sat at our computers alone, at home, unable to write, in our little rooms with the people outside, unable to write? There was a layer of fear hovering over our shoulders, wasn't there at the time. And on every page that fear came through. And it was difficult for me to write. As I said, that fear on the plane lasted when I got home to sit here at this computer where I've written for the past 15 years. But at some moment I decided it is always safe inside my manuscript. It's always safe inside a book. And, I, and I, those doors opened and the fear went away as I delved inside my manuscript and entered the world of my book. As authors, we deal with fear every day, don't we? Fear that we'll never have another good idea. Fear that what we have written is terrible. Fear that we will never be able to fix it. But here's what I know. Everyone has doubts but nothing in the world takes the place of persistence. Even in the face of fear, even in the face of the unknown, a writers know we put our fingers on the keys and we keep going forward. How many of you have read, and I wish I could see you all, how many of you know the book Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. It is a marvelous book on writing. And if you don't have it, not right now, don't get it right now, wait till the keynotes are over. But after that, go get Bird by Bird. And the way, the reason that book was titled Bird by Bird is that when Anne Lamott, the writer, was growing up, she had a little brother. And one morning at breakfast, her brother told her dad that he had to write a book about the birds of North America, the birds of North America, and that it was due the next day. And his brother, you know, her little brother was whining and saying, Dad, Dad, how am I supposed to write a book about the birds of North America in one day? And his father said to him, bird by bird, buddy, bird by bird. And that is how we are as writers, isn't it? We know that we have to go word by word, bird by bird, word by word every day. And if we just persist and advance the story, we will have a book at the end. And number two, that is comes out of bird by bird. What we learned in the pandemic is that we have to go day by day, don't we? We learn to put one foot in front of the other, to see what happened the next day and just go on. And especially in writing, because even with word by word, writing is difficult. And in fact, what I learned during the pandemic is if you're not working, if you're not feeling that it's difficult, you're probably not working hard enough. Most books, and you writers should know this, most books start out as really bad first drafts. So just keep, like what I do is I just, I look at, I, I can't begin to tell you that I, I'll type a sentence and I'll say, wow, that is terrible. That is the worst thing that anybody has ever written. And I think, yep, just go on and write another terrible sentence and write another terrible sentence and write another terrible sentence. You are not writing a book, just persevere. You are writing a page. If you think to myself, if you think to yourself, oh my golly, I have to write an entire book. How am I going to do that? You'll just stop yourself. It's too big an obstacle. Just write word by word, a page a day. 250 words a day. And if you write that page a day, by this time next year, in the next When Words Collide, you will have a first draft of the book. If you have a hard time writing, don't give up. It doesn't mean you're a bad writer. It just means that you're having a bad day. You're having a bad day. The key, the key is to just do it. Just do it. Don't leave this world regretting that you didn't finish your book. But don't leave this world having given up. When I was writing my, when I hit the wall, I have to say, on my first book, I called my mom and I said, mom, I'm so bummed. You know, I love this book. I think it's going to be good, but I just, I'm not sure if I can finish it. And my mom said, well, dear, 
You will if you want to. You will if you want to. And I realized that was the essence of everything, wasn't it? It was all about my passion and my compulsion and my obsession and my desire to write this book. You will if you want to. My, one of my favorite quotes is from Thomas Edison. And he said, when you think you have exhausted all of the possibilities, remember this, you haven't. It's not that there is no solution to your book problem. It's just that you haven't thought of it yet. And I promise you that you will. Um, and that leads me to num another thing we have learned. Number three, we have learned to be brave. During the pandemic, as writers and as people, we have learned to be brave. We have learned that in life, we cannot know the future. We don't know. And when we take a step outside our door every time, there are dangers that we can't imagine. And we have to do the best we can every day. Writing a book is not that dangerous, isn't it? Is it? It's not that dangerous. So be brave there too. Just try it. Just write it. It's not your book is not a test. You can go back, you can edit, you can erase, you can do it over, you can see what works. No one is going to see it until you show them. So just keep at it. Stephen King says the hardest part is just before you start. And isn't that so true? Because once you are doing it, once you are in the pages of your manuscript, you are involved, you are subsumed, you are passionate about it. Just do it. Just start. No one, no matter what is going on in the world around you, it is safe inside your manuscript. It is always safe inside your manuscript. Another thing that we learned in the pandemic, number four, classics are classics for a reason. Stories are memorable and valuable. And sometimes going back to what makes us comfortable can be rewarding. How many of you read your favorite books during the pandemic? Why do we love them? Why do we as readers and writers love them? Think about it. We have learned in the pandemic to go back to basics, to health and shelter and friends and food and love and family and our love of books and writing. The pandemic has shown us what is important, not only in our lives, but in the pages of the books. When you read your favorites, what do you learn from them? That there's a character you care about, a problem that needs to be solved, that the good guys win and the bad guys get what's coming to them. And in the end, you, you change the world a little bit and you get some justice. That's all you need to know for your book. Write something that will give readers the same joy that those classics give to you. Number five, we have learned in this pandemic, haven't we, that we are nimble. We are nimble. We can pivot. We can go from waking up in the morning and going to work and sending our kids in the school and coming home at night at six o'clock to make dinner to all being together in the same house every day and being terrified to go outside and still making it work. We have learned to grab our time to write when we can. It, maybe it's not how it used to be, but we can make it work. If you can handle the terror of the pandemic, you can write a book, can't you? Things that seemed impossible at one point might seem more conquerable now. Sue Grafton used to say, get over yourself. You're only writing a book, right? It is always safe inside a book and savor your new perspective. You can juggle, you can balance, you can make your life work. Number six, we have learned that we can study and learn and get it right. Think how much we didn't know about COVID when this started and think how much our knowledge has grown over these months. We can do that in writing too. And look at you, you are here. You have taken a big step in coming to this conference and think how much you will learn. Think how much your life will change at this conference. You have put your trust in your own brain, in your power to learn and in your power of understanding. As Terry said, do you read, do you study? Um, have you been mindful about your place in this wonderful profession? This is where we grow. This is where we learn. This is where we take it all in and learn about how to be a writer. We have time to do that now. Um, number seven, 
We have learned patience, haven't we? We have learned patience. That's number seven. We have learned that things may take longer, things may get canceled, things may not happen at all. At all and we have learned get, to get over that a little bit. We've learned to expect disappointment a little bit and take that um, and take that as a as a take that at ease. Take that um, without being upset about it. Take that as an everyday thing that's going to happen. Yep, as Terry said, everything's going to change. So one of the things about writing is patience. Nothing is going to happen overnight, especially not the acceptance of your management. Uh, sorry, especially not the acceptance of your manuscript, the word I'm looking for so carefully, by your agent or editor. So don't rush, no matter how much you want to, don't rush. Don't get swept away by your first novel enthusiasm. To make it really good takes much longer than you think it will. And to send in your first manuscript too early will make you miserable because you only get one chance to command someone's attention. Send it out before it's ready and you are squandering your opportunity to find your perfect champion. When in doubt, what we have learned from the pandemic, when in doubt, wait, just wait, wait a week, wait two weeks, and then read it again, and then call me and tell me how right I was that we should embrace being patient. Number eight, and we, because in the pandemic, we have learned, as I said, we have learned things are not always going to work the way we hope. And that means for us as writers, there are going to be rejections. There are going to be disappointments. There is going to be unhappiness. It is part of the deal. Editors and agents in our writing life will say no. You're going to hear no. But that rejection is not about you. It's not personal. Something there is, sometimes there isn't anything wrong with the book an editor rejects. It's just not the book that they were looking for. I had so, let me just read you very, very quickly. This is one of my rejection letters for my first novel. I'll just read a tiny bit. This says, thank you so much for sending Primetime by Hank Phillippe Ryan. The author has such an engaging voice and her firsthand knowledge of the broadcast industry combined with her own impressive position, blah, blah, really make this project stand out. Unfortunately, after giving it considerable thought, I'm afraid we'll be passing on this project. And let me tell you what happened. I know it was devastated. Let me tell you what happened with that disappointment. Two days later, that editor called my agent back and said, I can't get Hank's plot out of my head, but it's too light and too chicklity for me. Can she rewrite the whole novel as a big women's fiction mystery and then send it back in? And my agent asked me if I could do that. And I said, I'm a writer, I'm a writer, watch me write. And I rewrote that entire book, and that became Primetime, which won the Agatha for Best Novel of the Year. I was rejected, and that prize came as a result of the rejection. So take it in stride. It's going to happen, and you never know what wonderful thing is around the next corner, step by step, bird by bird. Number nine is a big one. We have learned in the pandemic that people will not always agree with us. People will not always agree with us. Nothing has made that anything more clear than that during this pandemic. And in book world, we think we're grown-ups, but it's very difficult to take criticism of your writing. It's very difficult to take criticism of your manuscripts. When someone tells you that your character seems kind of wimpy or in the middle of the book kind of sags or your amateur sleuth, like, why didn't she just call the police? Um, your, your, first, your first action is going to be to feel defensive. You're going to start defending yourself about this criticism. But keep in mind, you don't have to think what they think. You don't have to do what they say. But you might just, if you listen, you might just learn something. We have learned during the pandemic to try to keep an open mind. Keep in mind that as for reviews, I can tell you, I can tell you not to read them, um, but you will. So if you do remember this, 
A review is just what one person thinks. It's just what one person thinks. It is not the truth, okay? It is not the truth. It is just what one person thinks. And that is the final thing that I have to talk to you about tonight. Number 10, what I've learned from the pandemic is that we have learned in this pandemic that we are a community. We rely on each other as writers. We care about each other as writers and people. We are in this together. We have learned to be patient, to be generous. We have learned to be helpful and kind, to take care of our writer friends, to be authentically happy for their successes, right? It's everybody can win. Everybody can have a turn. If a friend wins or gets on the bestseller list and you don't, be genuinely happy for them. Your turn will come. And that is what brings us together tonight, that this race goes to the persistent and to the devoted and those who understand that we are so lucky and that what we're doing is special. Do you know the folk singer, Judy Collins? Please tell me that you do. I told my producer, who's about 30, that my husband and I were going to go hear Judy Collins at a concert several years ago. And my producer says, Great. That sounds wonderful. I had, I, you know that she had no idea who Judy Collins was. And I said, you know, Judy Collins, the folk singer. She sang both sides now. I said, I couldn't have gotten through college without listening to her records. Um, and my producer says, Rec records? No, she knew what a record was. She knew what a record was. I know she does. But anyway, Judy Collins, who was 72 at the time of this concert, gorgeous, big, um, gray, gorgeous hair, very, very slinky, tight pants, black boots. She hasn't lost one bit of her voice. She was quite amazing. And she told us a story about how when she was a little girl growing up in Denver, her parents had told her that she was going to be a concert pianist, that her destiny was to be a concert pianist. And she practiced and took lessons and that's all that her life was about. But she told us that she knew from the minute she knew anything that she was destined to be a folk singer. And she told us that at age 19, she decided, forget about this piano thing. I'm moving to New York. And she said, I, I packed my bags and I moved to New York to be a folk singer. And she said, I took my songs with me. I took all my songs with me. And then she said, of course, I hadn't written any of them yet. I hadn't written any of them yet, she said. And that just touched me because I think we all have songs. We all have songs. We may just not have written them yet. So my message to you is go and write your songs. And I cannot wait to hear them. Thank you so much, Hank. That was amazing, inspiring. I did not. I, I did not leave. I just reached behind what? me to grab a copy of yes. Bird by Bird. So <laughs> I was right within reach. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to let you rest in the green room while we bring up our last guest, Edward Willett. <laughs> Edward Willett is the award-winning author of more than 60 books of science fiction, fantasy, and non-fiction for readers of all ages, including the World Shaper series and the Masks of Agarima trilogy as E.C. Blake, for Daw Books, the YA fantasy series The Shards of Excalibur, and the YA SF novel Star Song, among many others. He won Canada's Aurora Award for Best Long-Form Work in English in 2009 for Masaguro, and for Best Fan-Related Work in 2019 for the World Shapers podcast, where he interviews other science fiction and fantasy authors about the creative process. He's been shortlisted several times. His 12th novel for Daw Books, the humorous space opera The Tangled Stars, comes out this fall. Ed is also the owner of Shadowpaw Press, named after his black Siberian cat, which has published two anthologies of short fiction by guests of the World Shapers podcast, Shapers of Worlds, and Shapers of Worlds Volume 2. Volume 3 is planned for this fall. Ed's nonfiction titles run the gamut from children's science books and biographies to local histories to genetics demystified, published by McGraw-Hill. A former newspaper reporter and editor, Ed is also a professional actor and singer who has performed in numerous plays, operas, and musicals 
over the years. Ed lives in Regina, Saskatchewan with his wife, Margaret Ann Hodges, a past president of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan. They have a college-aged daughter, Alice. Thanks, Mark. And uh, here I am batting cleanup here at the end, thanks uh, by virtue of having a W as my uh, uh, first letter of my last name. It seems like my whole life I've been coming in last because of alphabetical order. You know, I should... I should uh, launch some sort of a campaign to end that. <laughs> but here I am. And uh, that just ties in pretty well with what several of the other guests have said. I, I, wanted, I wanted to cast your minds back to August 1977. There were two important things happening that month. Uh, one was that I was on my way to Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas, where I would be going into journalism uh, as my major. Uh, my parents were driving me down there. And if you're wondering why I went to Arkansas, it's because that uh, university, which was affiliated with the Churches of Christ, was where my parents had met, as they like to say, at uh, two o'clock in the morning in the back seat of a car, <laughs> where they were to, you know, to be fair to my parents, all they were doing was getting a ride with somebody home for Christmas. But uh, that's where we were going in 1977. And so that starting journalism at the university was kind of the start of my attempt to become a professional writer. The other thing that happened in August 1977 was the release of a second compilation by the Grateful Dead, which was called What a Long Strange Trip It's Been. I'm pretty sure I was completely unaware of that at the time, not being a Grateful Dead listener, since our family, we tended more to the country side of things. But uh, looking back now, it's kind of auspicious that that came out the same year that I began my uh, professional writing career in a way, because... Uh, it has been a long, strange trip. And it occurred to me that what might be interesting for this keynote address was to talk about the ways that writing careers can be unexpected, that they don't necessarily follow what you expect them to be, and that there are an awful lot of things you can do as a writer uh, that you may not have thought of. And I have done quite a few of them. And now, to be fair, my actual writing career started a bit earlier than that. Um, I knew fairly early on that I wanted to be a writer. I wrote my first complete short story. I was 11 years old, and it was called Castro Glass Hypership Test Pilot. So you can see that my mind was pretty much set on uh, science fiction very early on. Of course, I was reading all the usual things, uh, Tolkien and Narnia and uh, Madeline Lingo has been mentioned tonight already in one of the, the keynotes. Um, I was reading all of that. Andre Norton was a big influence, Robert A. Heinlein, you know, that's the era I come from, Isaac Asimov, et cetera. It's hard to stop listing them once I start. <laughs> uh, I wrote three novels in high school. In fact, in fact, the third one, The Slavers of Thok, you can tell it was a serious fantasy novel because it had a map. There it is. That's the map to my grade 11 novel, Slavers of Thok. So about the time that Terry was writing Sword of Shannara, I was writing Slavers of Thok, uh, that you will probably never read, <laughs> Slavers of Thok. Uh, but I decided somewhere along in there that I wanted to be a professional writer. But I was also reading the writing magazines, and I saw that you could not be a professional writer right off the bat. And I thought, well, while I'm waiting to sell my first novel, because I was convinced at the age of 17 or so that as soon as I sold a novel, my path would be easy uh, from then on. That's all I had to do was sell that first novel. But it might take a year or two. I thought, well, what could I do that would be related to writing? And that's why I went into journalism. I had no burning desire to be a journalist. Uh, I actually found being a reporter a little uncomfortable. I didn't really like asking people impertinent questions and that kind of <laughs> defines the life of a reporter. But I did it. I went off, I got my journalism degree, I came back. Uh, I started at the Weyburn Review as a newspaper reporter and a photographer and already th things started to take kind of an odd turn. They hired me as a, I was only 20, and they hired me as a sports reporter. And the only sport I'd ever played was one year of high school football. I was covering hockey, which I'd never interested me in the slightest, despite growing up in Canada, because we had moved up there from Texas. And as I even had a sports column. It was called, I kid you not, The Sport Hole, uh, where I would write things about sports, which was certainly nothing I had ever thought I would be writing when I decided I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I also had another column called Eddying Thoughts, which was kind of whatever came into my head. And all through that time, though, I was still I'm still thinking, you know, I'm just going to get that first novel. And I was writing all that on the side. I was writing fiction, but I was writing all the time. Uh, feature articles. I interviewed politicians. I interviewed somebody who climbed Everest. I interviewed a television evangelist. I interviewed, oh, 
a young computer geek. I interviewed athletes uh, week after week after week. I was writing thousands of words. Uh, and I was a professional writer, but I still wasn't quite what I had thought my career as a professional writer was going to be. And that just kind of continued. So after I'd been at the Wave Interview, at the ripe old age of 24, I became news editor. And I edited the newspaper for four years. And then I saw an opportunity to come to Regina, where I live now, as communications officer for the Saskatchewan Science Center. I wasn't particularly interested in the communication side of that, the public relations side of that. The only thing I remembered from my public relations class, and I often quoted, is that 90% of public relations is wasted and nobody knows which 90% it is. The other one was don't lie to the press, but I think that one is often ignored by PR people. But uh, I, I had an opportunity to write science exhibit copy, and I'd always enjoyed writing about science. So, okay, I would do that. Meanwhile, pumping out those novels and not getting a taker anywhere. Uh, I don't know how many I had by the time I moved up here. It must have been four or five unpublished novels, but I was writing, and my, my career was at least I was doing something with words. So I was at the Science Center for five years, and finally, in 1993, I quit my job to become a full-time professional writer, and the first thing I did was go on a school opera company tour as an opera singer, <laughs> because... Whatever would pay the bills is what I discovered it means to be a, a freelance writer uh, right off the bat. And that has kind of been my motto ever since. I have written a lot of different things. I wanted to tell you about some of the more unusual ones. I mean, okay, admittedly, if you want to have a life as a freelance writer, perhaps the opera singing thing does not apply to each and every one of you. Although if you can get into it, it certainly is fun. And I've done a lot of uh, other theater. In fact, Right off the bat, I actually, before I did the opera tour, I was playing Santa Claus for a small uh, company that did kind of Christmas shows. So, ho, 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 I got very good at that. And uh, oddly enough, I got to play him again later, and I got to play Scrooge, too, all in the same uh, in the same production. So, you know, the acting side of things is is has been a great little sideline, but writing was always what I really wanted to do. So some of the other things I've written, let's see. Well, um, right off the bat, I finally got my first book. My first book was published. My first book, I was so excited. It had my name on it, had a little bio, the whole thing. My first book was using Microsoft Publisher for Windows 95. And it was so successful. There was a sequel using Microsoft Publisher for Windows 97. I'm sure I'm Spielberg somehow has missed those, but at any moment, I'm expecting him to, to get in touch and make those into major motion pictures. I'm sure, that's going to happen. I wrote uh, books about using Microsoft Office and using Microsoft Publisher. I got flown down to America Online headquarters when there still was such a thing in uh, outside Washington, DC. And I wrote a book about uh, creating cool web pages using uh, AOL's software at the time. All this stuff, very interesting, nothing to do with what I really wanted to write, which was fiction, which I was writing, but not selling a lot of. I had sold a, a couple of short stories. My first short story was not science fiction and fantasy. It was probably uh, it was inspired by working at the Weyburn Review, and it was a story about two kids trapped in a blizzard on the Saskatchewan landscape, published in Western People, uh, which was the magazine of the Western producer agricultural newspaper. My second story, I sold another story to Western producer, and I'm happy to say is probably the only science fiction short story ever published, ever published in the Western producer agriculture magazine. Involved, it's complicated, but it involved aliens who were growing exploding onions and things like that. To, uh, it's really hard to explain. But anyway, it was called Strange Harvest. I do remember that. Still, though, no novels. I was writing these computer books. Um, I mentioned the Sports Reporter, Science Center. I started doing a science column while I was at the Science Center. Uh, I wrote about the science of everyday things. I did that for almost 20 years, a column that uh, I was a regular guest on CBC Afternoon Edition uh, here in uh, Regina. and I, I did uh, a science column uh, starting at the Science Center, and then I took it freelance, and I did it for all those years. It was in the local paper. It was in some other papers. It was in St. John's uh, Newfoundland paper for a while, the Evening Telegram out there, and a few others like that. Never expected to do that. Still wasn't what I really wanted to do, which was make a living full-time as a fiction writer. That's always what I was aiming for. Wasn't there. Uh, my first novel finally did come out during this time frame. Uh, it was called Soulworm. It was published by one of the worst publishers in the world. 
And uh, the sequel came out. I actually have the sequel here because it also it was not a sequel, but my second book for that same publisher has the worst cover art I have ever had on any book with my name on it. Uh, Dark Unicorn, it was called. And you can see it's it's really not good. However, at least I had a couple of novels out. They made absolutely no money. I got some uh, awards nominations, though. That was nice. Still not getting to where I wanted to do. I wanted to make a living as a writer. Still wasn't doing it. What else did I do? Communications officer for the uh, city of Regina for a while, uh, up on top of the uh, city hall, which is a 17-story building here. I was up on the 16th floor. 17th is where the mayor's office was. And it was literally a case of don't look out the window in the morning because you'll have nothing to do in the afternoon. I remember doing a whole thing about trivia about the city that was supposed to be published in the newspaper. Nothing ever happened with it, but they, they paid me. And I actually got quite a bit of writing done up there because on WordPerfect, I had to use that um, because I really had nothing to do. But yeah, it was, I was there. Uh, I did a, a, a stint as the advertorial editor for the, uh, the Leader Post, the Regina Leader Post, which was advertorials are that stuff that read like editorial, but they're actually paid for. So they're usually about new businesses that are starting up or stuff like that. I was doing that at the time. Other freelance stuff that I had never thought I would be doing. I wrote stuff for a magazine called Inquest. And actually, that one is one of the ones I really wanted to mention because I wrote an article for Inquest, which was it was not uh, computer gaming, but it was like Magic the Gathering and those kind of card games. And uh, I wrote one called uh, an article that I presented as the foreword to a book supposedly entitled Dragons, Our Fiery Friends by a fellow named Dr. Vladimir Kapasonik. And I said he'd been struggling for years to finish his definitive treatise on the science of dragons, inspired by the one he had seen as a small boy in 1911, mislabeled as a rare winged garter snake in a traveling fair. And that Dr. Kapasonik was then 98 years old and in a nursing home in Moose Jaw, <laughs> because Moose Jaw is just a funny uh, place name, and hoping to find someone else to carry on his life's work before it was too late. Never thought any more about it. That was fun. I enjoyed writing it. It was this little little funny thing. And then I started to get the occasional letter from kids asking me to pass on their names to Dr. Kapasonic because they wanted to carry on his work. And uh, I think I put some of it online and pretty soon it was popping up in PowerPoint presentations. He was like a, a go-to source for dragons. And it was on a, a Harry Potter fan site. He was an authority cited in someone's recreation of what a course in dragon studies might be like at Hogwarts. And it showed up uh, on various pages devoted to dragons and myth and folklore. And he was even an authority cited in a term paper on dragons on a site that sold term papers to students. I thought, well, that's that's interesting. I never would have pictured that happening when I decided to become a writer. Uh, I did eventually confess uh, that I had made the whole thing up. I didn't think I had to confess that, but I did in one of my science columns. But it still pops up. If I did a search just today, and you can still find traces of it on the internet of that particular article. Another part of my long, strange trip. Uh, some of the nonfiction I've written was mentioned earlier on That is that has been part of my long, strange trip. I have written biographies of, uh, let's see, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Andy Warhol, and Johnny Cash. So I lived in the 60s vicariously. I mean, I did live in the 60s, but I was a small boy uh, as I wrote all that. Got to put Weyburn in because Weyburn is uh, where the term psychedelic was termed because they did LSD research in the Saskatchewan Middle Hospital, which was uh, in Weyburn. A uh, little known fact. And I put that in. I got to you know, sneak that in when I could. Uh, so I did that. I wrote other biographies. I wrote a biography of the Ayatollah Khomeini. That was a fun one. Uh, I wrote uh, biographies of Orson Scott Card and uh, uh, J.R. Tolkien and uh, another author, Akira Cass, uh, for some another series. I wrote a book about the Iran-Iraq War. I wrote uh, a book about the mutiny on the bounty. I wrote several books about diseases, which is always fun because you always think you have them as you're writing them. And all the things that kill you really quick start with flu-like symptoms. So I did one on Ebola, flu-like symptoms. I did one on meningitis, flu-like symptoms. I did one on uh, hemophilia, which I wasn't worried about because that's genetic. And I did one on Alzheimer's, I think. I, I can't remember. <laughs> that's a terrible joke. I did one on arthritis. Uh, so, you know, lots of diseases. I did some other science stuff. Some of the weirdest ones, I did a book on how to skateboard. Never been on a skateboard in my life. I wrote a book about rock climbing, not a big sport in Saskatchewan. Uh, and I had never done it, and, but I wrote a book on it. Uh, and 
that's another thing that's been interesting about this long, strange trip is the number of things that I have learned by not just being able to focus on the fiction. And yeah, the fiction was happening all through that time. I mean, I started selling books to better publishers. I eventually started selling to Daw, one of the best publishers you can be with. Um, but I never got to the point where that was the sole thing I could do. It still isn't the sole thing I could do. So I continued writing other things. Um, and if you go into freelance writing, you will find yourself writing other things. I wrote the annual report for the electrical, electrical, electoral officer of uh, Saskatchewan. I wrote a history of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan, which has the uh, gave me my longest title, which because that was part of it. Uh, I wrote a history of the Saskatchewan Land Surveyors Association. I wrote the history of the Saskatchewan Mining Association. I wrote the history of J.D. Mullard and Associates, which is a an engineering firm that has done a lot of work with remote sensing. I wrote a history of the mine rescue competition in Saskatchewan. I wrote a political book about the Grant Divine years in Saskatchewan. I rewrote and updated the history of Government House here in Saskatchewan. I've done all that. One of the weirdest ones, which was actually mentioned, Genetics Demystified from McGraw-Hill. I wrote an entire book on genetics without ever having studied genetics. I taught myself genetics to the point where I could write that book. I even did, and I still can't believe I did this, I did all the figures using, I don't know, some primitive computer program I had. I wrote all of the figures and illustrations. I did all that. I cannot remember a thing <laughs> that's in that book, but I wrote it and it, you know, it had reasonably good reviews as a kind of a starting point to learn uh, genetics. So it's almost 20 years ago now, so it would be terribly out of date. Uh, another part of my long, strange trip. Some of the other things that I've written that never would have thought I was going to write. Uh, plays. I, I do have a, theatric, a theatrical side to me, and I'm a member of Canadian Actors' Equity, and I've done a lot of plays and operas and all that. It was mentioned. I've written a couple of plays and directed them. And, uh, you know, never really would have thought of that back when I was heading out to be a, a writer. I was always going to be just novels. And yet here I am writing plays. And then one of the weirdest ones, I actually wrote, I actually wrote a poetry book. I do not self-identify as a poet. But in 2018, the Poet Laureate of Saskatchewan, uh, Gerald Hill, uh, for Poetry Month that year, sent out uh, every day for the month of April, two lines of po uh, poetry from published Saskatchewan poetry and challenged members of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild to write poems. And I latched onto that, much to my surprise. I wrote a poem every day, incorporating those two lines. But being who I am, they're all science fiction and fantasy poems. And at the end of you know a month, I had enough for a, a small book of poetry, 24 poems, I think it was. And I found uh, someone who would publish it. And I uh, hired my niece, actually, who's a very talented artist in Alberta, to illustrate it. And the result was I tumbled through the diamond dust, and I can now say I'm a poet. Still writing novels, you know, the Massive Agreement trilogy as E.C. Blake, Mage Bane as Lee Arthur Chain, the various uh, Edward Willett books uh, up to the last three, which are in the World Shaper series, the new one that's coming out, The Tangled Stars, I've written for smaller publishers. I've killed a number of publishers. I didn't anticipate that when I started my writing career, that my first publisher, unfortunately, that first one, I think, may still exist in some format, although the books have finally come back to me. Um, Lobster Press went under, Rusan, which published me, went under, Kato Books, which had been around for 40 years, published me and went broke. Bundoran Press uh, closed down, they published me. One in Winnipeg that started up called Rebel Light published me and only lasted another year or so. so uh, Daw seems to be hanging in there. And I don't think it's my fault, but that has been part of my long, strange trip to this point. Um, so... I guess the point of all that is you don't know what your writing career is going to look like. I have 25 novels published, uh, 12 uh, through DAW, uh, all these others through the other publishers. Many of those that went under, I've now republished through Shadowplot Press, which that's another thing I never thought I would be doing was, was starting a my own publishing company. Um, I never have gotten to the point where I can say the only thing I do is write fiction. That's still where I would like to get to. I'm gonna be an overnight success any day now and just write fiction. But I don't regret writing all this other stuff uh, either. And uh, some of the rewards are unexpected. Like uh, in Shadowpaw Press, it was mentioned the anthologies that I've uh, kickstarted, uh, Shapers of Worlds. If you had told me back in 1977 that I would be 
publishing a story in an anthology I had edited by Joe Haldeman. It would have blown my mind. That was, you know, I'd read The Forever War. To think that I would someday know him, had gone to dinner with him, had met him, had talked to him, and I was, I'd interviewed him, I was publishing him. And the podcast is another thing I never would have expected. I'm up to 115 episodes, and I'm, I've interviewed some of the biggest names in the field and people who are just starting out as well, talking about the creative process. I'm going to get a book out of that. I'm going to be writing a book maybe this, this year, a nonfiction title, uh, talking about the creative process. So it has been a long, strange trip, and it's not the one that I expected that uh, I would be having to when I got this far into my career. Uh, but, you know... I can't really say that I'm unhappy about it. Sometimes, my wife will say, sometimes I seem very unhappy about it, but I'm not really. I mean, I've written about things I never would have imagined I would be writing about. I've learned about things I never would have imagined I'd be writing about every every uh, topic under the sun. I've communicated with, with other authors and people I would never have imagined I would be talking to. That, that journalism background has come in really useful for all the interviewing and stuff I do. I think everything I've learned, and I hope that I've also provided enjoyment, enlightenment, and maybe better grades for school children <laughs> through my educational books. Uh, there's a lot of books, you know, this stuff I've created wouldn't have existed if I hadn't hadn't created it. So one of the questions I end with in World Shapers, and I'll kind of end with it here, is uh, why do you write? Why does anyone write? I get a lot of answers to that. Um, and, you know, I've, I've often said I write fiction because it's fun, and to a large extent, that's true. I want to tell stories. I want to entertain people. I want to you know, express ideas, all of that. But I think it really comes down to, I want, it, I'm leaving a mark on the world in some fashion. Um, when I'm gone, which I hope is a very long time from now, there will still be some record of my existence and of all the hours, many, many, many hours I've spent at many, many, many keyboards typing many, many, many words. I'm, I'm leaving some kind of, of a record of my existence. And maybe I haven't changed the world. I really don't think I have. Maybe I've changed one or two people. Maybe. I don't know. But at least you can say, I was here. I existed. I created these things. And I don't think that's a bad legacy. Having said that, uh, a better legacy would be millions of dollars in income in my bank account that I can leave to my daughter. So if you would like to go out, buy my books and tell all your friends and enemies to buy them too, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ed. I just want to remind you from something that Paula said is that you're not coming in last. You're bringing us home. And thanks for bringing <laughs> us home. <laughs> All right. I'm going to bring up our other guests, going to run them up from the, uh, from the green room, bring them back to the screen. I'm going to change the format so we're a little bit closer, a little bit closer. We can see everyone. And uh, I am going to invite uh, folks to leave comments. Uh, I am aware that there is a naughty person leaving very naughty comments. I have banned them or I've blocked them and I'm going to be banning them. So we won't be talking about those comments. But uh, questions that you have, comments, I want to first start by just sharing some of the comments throughout the, uh, from, from the, uh, I guess from the, uh, the, 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 the keynotes that we've seen. And I, I just have to scroll back up because there's quite a few comments that I've seen. And uh, we've got, of course, from uh, Randy saying, thank you, Terry. That was great. Uh, and then, of course, uh, terrific message, story and message. Uh, Susanna uh, enjoyed <laughs> and uh, great title and um, excellent talk. Powerful message. Thank you. And um, let me see. There's... Um, Colleen loves the format. So Colleen Winwards Clyde is awesome. This this keynote format is an amazing, an amazing thing. Uh, Nancy said, uh, such a varied writing career. It's honorable. And of course, Sean offers the advice, don't include those publishing house destructions in your <laughs> next query letter. So um, <clears throat> I, um, I want to uh, ask some questions. I'm going to throw a question specifically based on things that you guys have said. Uh, and I will probably address the people who said them first, but then I would love for everyone else to just jump in and offer their their perspective on it because I really I really enjoy that. So I'm actually going to tie in something that Edward said, something that Terry said, and and I'd love you guys to reflect on that. So Terry talked about the importance 
of reading well outside your genre, reading everything, whether it's other genres, nonfiction, all the things, in order to develop yourself as a writer. That that's a really, really critical skill. And Ed talked about this journey that was sort of this convoluted journey where he did everything. He wrote all kinds of books completely, you know, genetics and things that were not the thing he wanted to do, which was to write fiction full time. And so I wanted to kind of ask you guys both about that. I, I mean, there's a comparison there, but also um, what what other elements in terms of that reading outside your genre or experiencing things outside of your dream, how that actually solidified you in, on your own writer journey? Uh, maybe, maybe I'll start with Terry on this one. Well, I think if you want to be a writer, uh, you have to learn to grow. Um, I talked a lot about how things change over the course of your life. I never thought that was going to happen. I thought I'd be writing the same thing forever. And I am sort of, but you know. But it's very helpful to move outside the experience that you have normally uh, and the people that you deal with normally to see some other areas because I, I think it helps you tremendously to see forms of writing that you wouldn't necessarily consider otherwise and to continue to learn how other writers do things. How other writers do things uh, can be extremely instructive. Everybody kind of spends a lot of, uh, used to be, now we're the 800 pound gorilla, but it used to be fantasy was kicked to the curb as some sort of child's experience and certainly no suffering respecting uh, adult would read in that field. Uh, but I think we've gotten past that over the last, particularly over the last 20 years. So we don't have quite that diminishment anymore, but we do still have the problem of writers struggling to find things to write about. And I think it helps tremendously to think outside the box and go outside the field in your own reading to see what else is out there. Thank you. Um, and Ed, you talked about the value of you wouldn't change it, right? All of those other things that you did on, on that journey? No, because when I look back at it, you know, there, because of the, the assignments I was getting and the, the people who have come to me to write things has certainly had me educating myself on all sorts of things that I never would have known about if I hadn't had to write these books. And I think, uh, well, of course, Hank is a, is a journalist. And one of the things that journalism does do is it you know you you are constantly learning things about people and about about things that maybe you don't know any anything about i always said when we had journalism interns uh, you know don't be afraid to ask questions if you don't know something you're not expected to know anything what you're expected to do is find things out and communicate that to other people and that's what i've been doing now and i i do think i i confess well i do read outside the field for pleasure reading, I tend to read inside the field, but I do so much reading outside the field for all this other stuff that I do that I do do a lot of reading outside the field. And there's no question that it feeds into to my fiction writing. And uh, Hank, Susanna, do you guys have any comments on that sort of the, the thought of reading outside your genre and doing things outside your I don't know genre? genre. I, I cross so many genres with what I do. Um, I was, somebody asked me about that in my my session this afternoon. What genre I fit into, and I'm I don't have one. I I I have history, mystery, romance, fantasy. Every it's all over the place. Like I'm a marketer's nightmare, and the you know so whenever like I have a broad spectrum of things that I that I sit on anyway. So when I'm going to a you know a writers conference, I'm already interacting with you know people from from you know across genres my my little group of writing friends that you know we meet and talk every thursday they're they're from everywhere they're from all different genres anyway so and as you know when you become friends with another writer you want to read their stuff so you know already my bookshelves are are full of everybody's different things plus all the old books that i am catching up on and and the nonfiction that i read for my my research so you know my mind is just swirling with stuff but i agree with terry you you, you have to you have to read very widely and not confine yourself. In fact, the last place I tend to read is is books that are like mine, simply because I I want to keep I I find other voices intrude on my brain a lot more easily when I'm writing a book and I've got a work in progress. And because I'm a very slow writer, I usually have a work in progress. So I find it's easier to go into the mystery field and read in mystery or fantasy or science fiction or um, 
you know, a romance or something and pick those up for my, my, um, my pleasure reading and to, to cross pollinate and, and learn what other people are doing and how they're handling scenes and, and bring that back into my own work. You know, I've been a television reporter for 43 years now. It's so crazy. Um, and I've wired myself with hidden cameras and confronted corrupt politicians and chased down criminals and gone undercover and in disguise, you know, been backstage at the airport and underground at the state house and gone places. Edward, I'm sure this has happened to you as well, gone places that I wouldn't have gone um, had I not been a reporter. And so those experiences, I don't take those experiences and cover them up a little bit and make them into fiction. But every little experience in all of our lives, no matter what we do, becomes part of the building block of the stories that we write. And we take a little bit from here and a little bit from here and a little bit from here and sort of like a Rubik's cube, twist and turn and change until it clicks into a completely new story. So if you don't have any building blocks for your story, um, it's going to be difficult for you to come up with a believable, seamless, authentic, genuine sounding story. I think that one of the things we might talk about, and I think it's so interesting, is that we're all talking about reading. Unlike Susanna, I just subsume myself in books in my genre. I, I love it. But being an author sometimes makes that be reading as an author is very different than reading as someone who isn't an author. I mean, I will put this out there. Sometimes I read the end of books first because do you too, Susanna? I love you. I knew I did even more because it's then I can start at the beginning and see how the author got there. I'm deconstructing the book on the way. And when I don't do that, that's when I know I have a really good book. That's when I know someone has written a really good book, when I forget to edit it along the way. What do you all think? Do you read that way ever? Susanna, you said you no, did. I read the last sentence because of, um, oh, and my brain is so dead today, but the the guy who wrote Under the Volcano um, ruined me because the, Mark will know this. Mark can, Mark can figure this out for me while, probably while I'm saying this. Malcolm somebody um, wrote Under the Volcano and I read the entire book and I got to the end and the last line, which I will spoil for everybody right now, is someone threw a dead dog after him as well, screaming into the abyss and I just thought, that's it. I'm never reading another book without reading the last sentence first because I just <laughs> all that time reading this book and I could have just, you know, not not read that book. I don't read the whole ending. I just read the last sentence because if anybody is throwing a dead dog after anybody who's falling screaming into an abyss, then I know I don't need to read that book. And, you know, so it's really just to get the tone of the ending, okay. you know. And My mother always read the last, the end of a book first. But yeah. I know. Yeah. What I, what I tend to do is read I, as an editor. So I'm, I'm constantly <laughs> thinking, oh, I that never, word, I that never read the endings of books. Never. I never do that. But what I do do and this is a terrible habit, uh, but if I'm reading somebody in my field, I hold a red pencil close at hand and I go through and mark out the mistakes that I find <laughs> all the exactly. way through. This is a, a really poor obsession to have, but I do that because I'm interested in seeing what kind of good you know, relationship they have with their editor or if they're even reading their work after they've published it. And a lot of times I can tell they, they, they didn't. They know, didn't bother. They didn't it's, funny, it's funny because um, when you're an author and you're reading a book, there's sort of three emotions that you have. One is sort of, oh my golly, this is so good. I am terrible. I'm never going to be this good. How can <laughs> I not have written this? And so forget about it. I'm going to give up. Or the other one is, one of the, one of the other ones is, how did this ever get published? This is the worst thing I have ever read in my entire life. Yeah. And then the third one is, how did they do this? How yeah. did they yeah. do this? And yeah. that is the most fun. That's what I thought you were going to talk about, Terry, when you were taking your red pencil, is you go back and you think, wait a minute, how did that, is that fair? And you go back and find the clue and find the foreshadowing and find what the structure really is and find that, that what the author put in that you missed the sleight of hand and the magic and the red herrings. I just love doing that, but it's sometimes it can be a little depressing. Or how do you, I like to do that? They, uh, I do. Doing, yeah. What were they doing technically? Like, did yeah. they exactly. did they do this? Like, you know, how did they scare me? How did they make me jump? What were they doing? Flippity flippity flip. You know, like, is go back, right? You know, yes. Sorry, Gary, I interrupted you. What were you going to say? 
I wasn't going to say anything. No, Terry was the <laughs> Terry. Terry was. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you said you like to do that. You said you like to do that. Oh, I, I I'm just saying that um, I like to decipher how a really good book works, which yeah. is what you were basically both talking about. Um, I, I don't do it with the bad ones. The bad ones, I just you know, I usually don't finish the book. I just go on to something else. But the ones I really love, and particularly outside my field, what did they do? that makes this book so compelling. Why do I love this book so much? And it's frequently has to do with language or the way they put their story together or something on that, or the characterizations, any number of things. But the trick is you're always looking for ways to make that happen. I have a really good story about this if you have about two minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I read a book by the, the person who wrote, now see I'm terrible now with names now that I've been stricken. No, we'll figure uh, it out. Who wrote, who wrote a, a World War II story. And in the, in the story about, I don't know, almost towards the end of the book, she has the, a conversation going on in a, in a hut in Italy between a family, members of the family. And right in the middle of it, the conversation ends. And I'm thinking, what the heck? So I go on you know, to read and it doesn't come back. And I realized what happened is, is that the Germans blew them up. The whole family and i thought this is really cool i want to do this how can i do it so i figured out a way to do it for one of the shanra books and i sent it in with my publisher and the publisher says oh you know this is pretty good but you didn't finish this one chapter it just ends and i thought well great i told them and they said okay well we'll try this and they got and i got dozens of letters from readers who said you didn't finish this chapter and i'm thinking you know, who am I writing this book for anyway? <laughs> Have they no clue? It was very obvious. It was a bomb. You know, the bomb blew up. But I didn't say that. I just had them talking about worrying about it and so forth. Sounds good to me. It sounds oh, you, you, you might have got dozens of letters, but you probably had, you know, I, thousands I got, of I got too cute for my own book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. good. That's something strong. subtle, like all capital letters. It says "boom." Just <laughs> <laughs> I that, I guess. yeah, but, you don't need "boom." You hardly ever need "boom." You gotta hope so. Anyway. But that's, that's the thing, though, isn't it? Like you know, because because it's I always call it like like reading books. When you once you reach a certain level of craft, reading books becomes like a busman's holiday, oh, right? Absolutely. It's like when I go to a museum as a former curator, I'm always like the lux levels are all wrong. You know, <laughs> the way you've got stuff mounted is terrible, and and. But when you find a book that you get lost in and you've read several pages and you're in that world, that's a treasure for a writer. I mean, that is something that you just, you know, it happens so rarely that somebody can can get you past that point when you're noticing. Especially, the, especially when it seems so effortless. Yeah. Then I can really hate that, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Then you're, then you're really like, hang the thing. It looks so right. easy. Yeah. <laughs> But it is, it's a gift. And, and, you know, I get, that, I get that with a few writers and I, you know, I really, really treasure it. And uh, those are the ones that I stack up and read in between my books awesome. and look forward to, you know. Now uh, I'm a completionist and, and Susanna, you were talking about Malcolm Lowry who uh, wrote uh, Under the Volcano. Thanks, Sean, for that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Other but no, it, 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 it's like it's going to be bug bugging people, right? Who, who yeah. what was the, what was the last? He name? might be I, I know it. I know it. I know it but... it's very well known. He's obviously more successful than me. But just but speaking of that, since Sean uh, jumped in and helped us out there, uh, and that and that kind of leads to something you said, uh, Susanna, it was very uh, integral to your talk was about community. You talked about the support you had from friends and family and loved ones and community. I'd love you to just talk a little bit more about that value and importance of community. And I would love to hear uh, our other panelists talk about uh, community oh. as well. Community, right. See, I didn't go to a conference until I was in my 40s. I think the very first conference I went to was BoucherCon in 2000, 2001. Um, yeah, because my eldest was two, so it was two thousand. It was October two thousand and one in Washington D.C. Right after nine eleven, that was really well timed with me. Yeah. Um, but the that was my very first time walking into a room full of other writers, where I was in a room full of other people that heard voices in their heads and actually, <laughs> okay, you know, it was all right. And at the time, I remember thinking, you know, because my first publication was nineteen ninety four, and this was two thousand and one. And all that time I'd been, you know, doing it all with my family and my friends around me, but no other writers. And it was such a 
sea change. And I remember thinking, why didn't I do this before? Why didn't I know about this before? So this, this community of writers is a very important thing. Whether you come virtually, whether you come, you know, in person, it is finding your people. I remember taking my eldest, this is completely off topic, but I remember taking my eldest when he was about, probably about 12 or 13, to um, the Canadian version of, of Comic-Con, which is Fan Expo in Toronto. And he looked across the, the room where everybody was lined up, ready to go in, and everybody's all like, you know, in cosplay and in costume waiting to go in. And he just looked at me and he, his eyes were just full. And he looked at me and said, it's my people. And I just thought, you know, that's that's exactly what I felt like the first time I was at a writer's conference, just walking through the sea of people. And finding that is, I mean, there's no word for it. You all know, because you're all here. You all know what it feels like. But the other thing I forgot to mention in that talk that is equally important and equally important part of our community are the readers. Whether you're published or not published, um, the readers on the other side of the book who complete our stories for us and who give us back so much without even knowing it, and especially during this pandemic time, what the readers have given me at times that they don't even know they're giving it to me. I will be sitting here in my little writing room, um, which is not that large. Um, and I'll be, you know, going through things that they don't even know about. You know, everybody's got stuff going on in their lives. I've got one kid overseas who goes to university. And when the pandemic came down, he was it, you know, in Europe and I was panicking. And a reader would send like a stray email at just the right moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, or I was worrying about my parents who were both in their 80s. And I, I, I went for a period of like over a year where I could not see my parents because they were afraid and I was afraid. And, and, you know, and a reader would send me an email about the difficulty they were having in their life. And I don't think readers realize, you know, what they give us. So that is part of our community as well. And I never felt really alone in here because I could always go to that email list and just feel like, okay, there's someone on the other side of this book who needs what I'm writing, who needs what I'm doing, and I'm not by myself. I might feel like I'm completely alone, but I'm not alone. And it's a, every time I read this sort of ivory tower, you know, writers are these, you know, individual creatures. I'm like, no, no, we're not. We're not really. We're not really. We're, we're shy. We're introverted, usually. Um, but we're, we're anything but alone. You know, we're, full of people wandering around our heads all the time where, you know, we have, we have family peeking in our doors at inopportune moments, wanting supper. We have, you know, we're anything but alone, but the readers are an important part of that too. Yeah. It's, I mean, you're so, you're so absolutely right about that. I was, I was past president of national sisters in crime in the U S and our motto now is you write alone but you're not alone. And there are things that people in the writing community, um, and I do think it's such a, let me just not finish that sentence, very Hank thing, but say that there is there is no writing community without the reading community. I mean, we all buoy each other and we all help each other and writers are all readers. And so we're all in this community together of people who love stories and storytelling and love words, but there's a, there's a language, there's a communication that we have in, in this realm, which is, I can say to you, what are you reading? Or did you read this? And you can tell me, and I can say, oh, I haven't read that, or I have read that, or didn't you love the part about the thing? Mm -hmm. I can also say to you, do you think it should be and or but? right here? Or do you think this is a semicolon or not? And I, people who are not in our world don't understand the conversations that we have. My husband and I were in a restaurant several years ago. I remember restaurants. We're in a restaurant several years ago. And I remember saying to Jonathan, well, you can't just throw someone off a bridge because you don't, you're not quite sure they'll die. And the waiter's like, ma'am, <laughs> I'm like, it's a book it's a book it's for a book it's for a book and my, my husband who's a criminal defense attorney and and works with me on my novels all the time you know knows that this is a writer topic somebody like the other day i was talking to somebody and she said well the book isn't any you know it's not really good until somebody dies 
Yeah. And, you know, we're all nodding our heads. Yep. And then I thought, you know, there are not many places where you could say that um, <laughs> and it would be OK. So we all grok each other. We all get each other. We all understand each other and we all understand the love of the process, the love of searching for a story, the moment when we think, wow, that's a good idea. I'm going to love writing this and I'm also going to love. It's kind of like cooking where you have a great idea for a, a dish, then you have the creativity, the fun of actually making the dish, and then you, you have the fun of giving it, offering it to someone who you hope will love it, and then you have the joy of having someone say, oh, I really love this. That's what it's like to write a book. You're never quite sure, you're just crossing your fingers, but it's about creation and imagination and love and that and storytelling, and that's what writing a book is. Very much. I had a, I had a, my family doctor when I was from the time I was about 11 to the time I was pregnant with my, with my eldest was this very, very no nonsense Scott who was, you know, very, very quiet. And I used to, but he, you know, he, had, I was writing by that point and I would actually be able to walk into his office and say, so if I had to drug a baby, yeah. And he would just go, oh, well, let me just, let me, let me just find the right thing to drug a baby with, you know, and, and his, his nurse would be like, you know, what are, what, you know, but it, the people that surround you, that support you. Yeah. Very important thing. I love what you said, though. I wrote this down about purposeful absence that people know, you know, when they know enough to stay away. And all of you, everybody who's out there and everybody on this panel is going to know, you know you're in, you're in your little writing room and you finally are in the story. And, you, you know, you, when you finally caught the wave and you're going forward and the writing's going great and you hear footsteps behind you, <laughs> and you think part of your brain is like, don't come in here. Don't, don't come in here. And then my darling husband, who you know I adore, he'll open the door and say, do you think this milk is bad? I'm like, just, just smell it. You just do it. Just smell it yourself. Just go away. Um, and you, we're, we're doing it out of love. And they're doing out of, they're just trying to live their lives and their real world. And we're feeling like, don't get us out of this moment. Don't take us out of the flow. And, it, uh, you know, he knows enough now to know just walk on by. Just keep walking by. So I'm going to tell him your line, Susanna, about purposeful absence. I love that. I keep saying I should make one of those flow charts, like, you know, that the the flow charts that like, are you on fire? If yes. yes no, to, you know, to, to knock, if not, you know. Doesn't Nora Roberts have that on her door? It says like, if, Probably. If you're on, unless you're on fire, don't come in here. <laughs> it was, wasn't it Samuel Coleridge who was interrupted while writing? Uh, Xanadu. <laughs> Xanadu, yeah. yeah. I think about I never, that. Was, was never able to get back to it. Yeah. <laughs> I think about that way too much, actually. Edward. <laughs> this happens when we're reading a great book, too. Yes. Yeah. I don't like people interrupting me when I'm in the middle of a book, uh, particularly if it's something that I'm really caught up in. If you just want to say, go away. Well, you do say, go away. Please. Yeah, actually, I didn't want to get <laughs> crass about it, but yeah. Please, I'm just reading this. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want to uh, throw up some great questions from, from our, our viewers. I want to throw some of these up to ask. So Paul asks, this is a question for everyone. Uh, what other genre have you not written in that you would like to try? I've always wanted yeah. to write a Western. I don't know why. <laughs> well, that's the only thing you haven't written. That's the thing. Because yeah. you're from the West. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's allergic to horses, so the research would be difficult. <laughs> I don't, I don't have anything. No. I'm writing exactly where I want to write. I don't want to write anywhere else. I'd like to read other things, but I don't necessarily feel compelled to write in other areas. Awesome. I would have said no up until a couple of months ago. I would have said no. I am definitely a thriller suspense person. Um, but a couple of months ago, and this is going to be a ridiculous thing to tell you because I'm not going to tell you what it's about, but I kind of had a good idea. I did have a good idea for still the same genre, but in a different time. Um, and I, it's one of those times when you have an idea and you just write it all down. You just write this all down because this is just coming out of you. Just like you said, Terry, it's just time to write down this idea. I can't keep it in my head. I'm going to write it down. Although I think about it all the time and it's, um, historical suspense. But Susanna, I'm in awe of you because I know um, the research 
that goes into making you. I mean, your books are so authentic and it's very daunting to me to think about opening that door. But in answer to your question, whoever asked that, you can, um, help you. You can move in with you like you did with the woman in Scotland, right? And you can come with it's not your time. Well, it's a different time altogether, a different genre altogether, but I am in awe of the um, devotion that goes into writing historical fiction when it's as good as yours is, um, that the bar is very high. So that might be stopping me. Earl Stanley Gardner always said, when you see something that scares you, you should just wade right off the riverbank, go out and meet it. Don't stand on the riverbank and watch it go by. Just go out there and meet it. So if you want to do it, just do it. I uh, see. This is the Earth, advice Earth. I would have given to myself. Yeah. This is the advice. Well, you heard. This is the advice I would have given to myself. But that's what we do also as writers. Like yeah. I can really help everybody with their manuscripts. So when I look at my own, I think, oh golly, I have no idea. Because so, see, you're yeah. thinking. You're thinking you have to do all the research first and then write the book, and you don't. You just go in until you hit a part, hit something you don't know, and then you research it, and then you keep going. See, this is a masterclass. Thank you. So <laughs> awesome. I always wanted to write because I because of when I grew up. Like I was born in the mid '60s. I grew up in sort of that era of the big, thick, chunky winds of war. You sure. know, the books that were, you know, they happened in all these different locations, and you'd have, you know multi-generational and one person over here in Paris and another person over here in London and another person in New York and these big giant sagas and I always wanted to write one of those and I thought with the last book I thought I thought the vanished days was actually going to be one of those I thought ooh, perfect setting you know I can do the Darien expedition as one of those I can have people in New York and people in Edinburgh and people in London and people in Spain and do the whole thing but what always happens when I get these these ideas and I think I'm going to make these big epics is is bit by bit by bit the characters once they get on the page just start distilling themselves down yeah. to a more like a smaller canvas and they just they just do what they want to do once they get on the page they're like yeah we don't want to do that we want to we want to go here we want to sit in this drawing room we want to have this sort of more you know more intimate discussion over here. We're going to still have suspense. We're going to still have a little bit of, you know, whatever going on, but we're not, we're not going over here. We're not going to do that. So I've come to the conclusion that like Terry, I, you know, I, I have my niche and I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm really happy with it. And it has changed. It has certainly changed since the like the 90s when I started writing because I've changed as you know again as Terry said very very wise words you're not the same person you were when you started writing so your books are going to change and what you're writing is really just the, your processing of life right so the more you live you're processing different things I have children now I have grown children now so my my interests and the things that I'm processing in my life are different than they were when I was a single 20 something person. It's one of the reasons though, that Edward is so impressive because the way that your brain is so nimble and can go to all those different genres. I mean, when somebody said to me once, could you write a romance? Could you, could you possibly write a romance? And I said to them for 400 pages and nobody dies, what would they all <laughs> What would everybody do? What would everybody do? And then they said, yeah, I guess we shouldn't write romance. So. Well, you could still kill somebody, just not the main couple. Oh, oh okay. See, oh, you know all. No, I think you're right. That's great. That's great. But it shows you that possibly we've sort of found our lane. Mm -hmm. No matter what we try to do, um, our writer brain re reins us back in and says, no, this is how you're going to be. I love that. You have to it's love that. Certainly when I'm writing nonfiction, I'm always wishing I could put in, you know, <laughs> something. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Cat, um, cat AI overlays. That's what they just need to walk <laughs> through the pages, right? I'm going to throw another question and we are getting close to the end. So I'm probably not going to get to all the awesome questions and, and my apologies to those who are asking these great questions. But question from Kim is basically, uh, how do you write when you're exhausted and you're not feeling it? Like, how, how do you actually get past that moment when you just, you know, how do you how do you do it? If I'm so well, pardon, Terry, courage. <laughs> Fear, fear, fear is a big one. Right. Um, sometimes I change location. Sometimes I'll just go sit in the bathtub because I get 
<laughs> I get a lot of story ideas in the bathtub. If I'm really tired, um, the characters will always talk to me. If I'm, you know, sometimes it's the screen that I'm, you know, I'm falling asleep on the screen, but I, I'll go sit in the bathtub and the characters will come. Um, but it, you don't have to write a lot. You just have to be, you have to show up and write a couple of sentences and then and a couple of sentences after that and a couple of sentences after that. And if you're lucky, you'll click into the groove and the characters will take over and the story will take over and then you're not tired anymore. Um, you know, you, it's a beautiful place to be when you're in the story and you lose track of time and someone has to actually come fetch you out because you've been up all night and, you know, it's, that's a wonderful feeling. You know, and Edward, you know this too, but as a, as a reporter for however many years as a general assignment reporter, I had to come in at eight in the morning and by six o'clock at night, I had to put a story on the air and it had to be perfect and it had to be a story and it had to be have audio and video and be edited together and be presented as a little movie on TV. And if I had said to the news director, you know, can I be on at 10 after six instead of six? Because I'm really not feeling it today. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have lasted at all. And I think, you know, coaches tell ball players, hold the ball every day, walk around with your football, remember how that feels. And I think you just tell yourself, I'm just gonna visit the world of my book. I'll say to my husband at night, I'm just gonna go say good night to my book. And I put myself in the manuscript and I can't tell you how many times he's had to come back downstairs and say, sweetheart, are you, are you coming up at all? Because sometimes, you know, it's a, first of all, you're a pro, it's your responsibility your book is due at a certain date and you can do it now and be not panicked or you can do it later and be completely panicked. It doesn't have to be perfect when you're writing the thing and it probably isn't going to be perfect when you're writing the thing. But writing a book is basically arithmetic. You're just adding and adding and adding and adding. And if you just keep going, even a little bit at the time, as Susanna says, at some point, inevitably, it has to be longer and longer and longer and longer. Then you can go back and fix it. So I do think a lot of it is it's your responsibility as a writer. Nobody cares as much as you do about finishing this book. Nobody's going to call you and say, did you do your thousand words? Only you. So you're in charge of yourself. And if you love it, then you'll do it. There's just really no question about that. And I, I don't do a thousand words just for people that are slow out there like me. You know, if I have a, you know, sometimes I do. It depends on the day. Sometimes I'll do yeah. that much. But, but quite honestly, if I do, you know, 250 words a day, yeah. I'm static. It's great. That's fantastic. I, you know, I'm a yeah. slow, slow writer. Yeah. So. Right. Oh, let me just um, say one more thing about that. My secret goal is a thousand words, but my stated goal is 680 words. And if I get to 680 words a day, I win, I succeed. And I set the goal, the bar low, so I can allow myself to succeed every day instead of setting myself up to fail. Right. And when we allow ourselves to succeed, the next day, all we want to do, we're just humans, all we want to do is go back the next day and succeed again. And that really works for me. Yeah. Well, why 680? Why is that, that that very specific number? Is there a certain meaning to that? Yeah, there is actually. I took the, I take the, the number of words in my book, which is about 100,000 words, and I figure out how many days I have until the deadline. <laughs> and then I divide, I, then I subtract a month for serious editing. Okay. And then I just divide and I think, okay, if I do 680 words a day up till this day, I'll be done. And I don't have to worry. And if I lose a day, then I think, well, I'm just behind 680 words and I don't panic. So again, the whole point is don't panic as we've read in whatever that book is. What was it? It's like a guide to the galaxy. It's like a guide. I knew, <laughs> I knew you know it. And, if I, and Sean, I want you to know, thank you. Um, I, we can't type in the comments or else I'd be responding to the Grok thing, but I, I, we can't type in the comments. But um, I, my whole goal of writing is not to panic, and I do everything I can not to panic. Although as long as, we're, as long as we're mentioning Douglas Adams, we should mention his other thing, which is that he loved deadlines. He loved the whooshing sound they made. Yes. <laughs> get, get me. Get. I always panic. I'm a panicker. I panic all the way. I panic from the first minute I sign the contract to the time I turn it in, and I just, you know, yeah. Yeah, constant, constant panic. Yeah, but it always means. I have 15. to say thank you guys. <laughs> Sorry, 
That's okay. I'm, just, I'm saying I'm not like that with My every book. Change. So. <laughs> Guys, this was, uh, we're coming up on the two hour mark for this. And I know you've been busy uh, yesterday, today, doing all the great things, the great talks. You were so inspiring your conversation, the keynotes. Really want to thank you on behalf of the entire WWC uh, community for uh, sharing your insights and thoughts and feelings and emotion and perspectives. This was a phenomenal evening. I want to say thank you guys so much. I hope you can get some rest because we still have more of when words collide taking uh taking place this weekend thank you guys so much thank you thank you thank you you're great mark good night thank you. and good night everyone thank you